Okay, uh, it's 9.30, so we can start. Welcome, everyone. This is the uh, core session at ITF 118. I am Marco Tiloka. My co-chairs are Jaime Jimenez and Karsten Borman, just uh, sitting there in case you don't see it on the screen. Um, people here at the meeting are assumed to have read the documents uh, in the agenda for today. Uh, we plan to hopefully make good use of time for face-to-face uh, high bandwidth discussion to progress the documents and as better comes in the next slides, of course, not well applies. Um, the attendance sheet is filled automatically through Miteko, speaking of which, uh, please um, sign in, even if you are in the room, scan the QR code uh, or through the web um, interface. Uh, Chess will pay attention to the chat. Uh, we have Christian as the official note taker, uh, <laughs> but a few other people volunteer to help. And please, everyone help, you find the link to the notes in the data tracker and now also in the chat. Karsten. Yeah, I just wanted to say somebody has put the air conditioning into translunar injection mode. <laughs> and uh, so we really have to make sure that we are hearing ourselves very, very clearly because the air conditioning is way too loud. Thank you. Okay, and this is an official ITF meeting, so the not well applies. Uh, get familiar with it if you're not already. You should have seen this um, quite sometimes this week uh, already. Uh, it's about uh, IPR and, and early responsible disclosure of those uh, to the best of your knowledge. Uh, it's also and especially about uh, our code of conduct, so please be nice and professional with one another. Uh, a few uh, practicalities uh, we've been recorded also according to the not 12 and if you are participating um, in presence uh, in the room uh, please sign in uh, in Miteco again through the QR code or the web interface uh, you can use the on-site tool on your mobile or uh, the full tool uh, on the web interface and um, in that case please keep your audio and video off if you want to go to the queue please join the queue on Miteco first then go to the mic, then you release yourself from the queue. Uh, for remote participants, please keep your audio uh, and video off unless you're presenting or uh, talking at the queue and try to use a headset. If you cannot talk and you're remote, please type mic or something in the chat to relate your question. So this is the uh, agenda uh, for today. Once we finish this um, introduction, we first consider two documents from the CoreConf cluster, student comi. Um, and then constraint resource uh, identify as a href. Uh, then we have uh, well two incarnations of group communication for co-op, meaning the group combis document and the pub sub architecture for co-op. And then we continue with DNS over co-op uh, with PAPID for all score um, or kudos and performance measurement uh, for co-op. And we conclude with. Uh, well, a presentation collective uh, feedback around topics and documents um, following the T2TRG meeting we had uh, last Friday. Uh, and the document that was also presented in the lake session um, earlier this week, uh, Greece to Adoc. Does anyone have uh, any bashing or change to propose to this agenda? Have none. Okay, uh, let's quickly go to the status of the documents um, in core. Uh, we got one recently uh, approved for uh, publication as an informational um, RFC, um, target at. Uh, so confetti are due for the actual publication as an RFC, but that should uh, definitely uh, be shown for the next ITF meeting, I suppose. Uh, thanks a lot for your work on this anyway. Uh, then we have core seed uh, again, in ISG uh, processing uh, since it's coming back uh, to the working group that resulted also in a new working group last call. Um, and there's currently uh, under ISG evaluation, there's work from the co-authors uh, for addressing uh, the different comments and ballots. 
and it's also on today's agenda for some updates. Uh, we also have a core OSCOR ad hoc uh, in ITF last call, describing how to use ad hoc specifically for uh, co-op and no score. Um, yeah, it's in last call for a, a few more days, after which the uh, authors plan to get back on addressing uh, the received reviews. And Paul Waters is the uh, assigned AD, which is uh, very good since he acted as uh, AD also for the main ad hoc document in the lake working group. Uh, then we have uh, quite a bunch of documents uh, post uh, working group plus call uh, at different stages. Um, so the group of score uh, document uh, produced um, a few revisions uh, recently, mostly to address the, the reviews from uh, our shepherd, Christian. And now it's uh, waiting on a follow up uh, from Christian and hopefully for the write up. Uh, from the CoreConf cluster, we uh, also have um, COMAI that completed a working group last call. Uh, there are comments from it um, to be addressed. Uh, it's also on the agenda for today, and we have a shepherd already uh, appointed. Uh, Young Library is uh, technically in post working group last call for a long while, uh, waiting for shepherd right up, but it, what, it was practically put on ice to uh, wait for the completion uh, of um, SEED and COMAI before we can get back to it. And uh, most likely after that, we'll, we'll run um, a new working group plus call too. Uh, but still a uh, post working group plus call. Uh, that's also the case for uh, group on this, uh, also in the agenda for um, today. It recently received um, uh, one more uh, review uh, from John Matson that was addressed in this uh, latest version. But otherwise it completed um, working group plus call um, three versions um in the past and we are practically waiting for um well receiving feedback uh, from the working group last call reviewer and the expected shepherd um is carson uh conditional attributes also completed the working group last call we are waiting for the authors to address uh some of the remaining uh comments uh, before we can move on but it was confirmed already at the previous meeting that uh, the intention is to to switch this from uh, informational to uh, standard struck, uh, no news about that. Uh, and then we have HRF also on the agenda for today. It, it did pass a uh, working group last call. There are still some points to be addressed and the few new ones that uh, have come up um, in recent discussions. Um, on other documents, one working group uh, item was also updated recently, multicast notifications, uh, though not in the agenda for today. Uh, and one was uh, recently uh, adopted um, OSCOR capable uh, proxies. Uh, and there's one document uh, pending um, working group adoption uh, call for a while, uh, GroupCom proxy, uh, that was considered on version six. And since then, well, uh, it hasn't happened yet. And there have been a number of rebump um, as is. And that's Francesca in the queue. Yes. So, um, Francesca Palombini, I was just wondering about. Um, the group com proxy document because my understanding was that there was a consensus to be adopted during a meeting and then it was supposed to be confirmed in the mailing list i believe and then um that call was never done i think please correct me if i'm wrong so uh if there isn't any reason then let's just get get it done thank you Thanks. And yet other documents, there have been a number of um, individual submissions resubmitted um, recently, mostly from uh, Christian's side, uh, and they appear in, in the um, aggregated slot that we have towards the um, end of agenda. Please have a read into these documents, um, come back with comments, preferably on the list. And as a last related uh, piece of news, you may have noticed that um, RSC 9482 was recently published just to advertise some um, use of co-op, uh, even if uh, not developed in, in this working group, but um, in ACE in this case, which is a very good result. Uh, some report from the Akatom build uh, cumulative during the past days. Uh, there has been some uh, activity in, uh, on CoreConf, uh, thanks Juan. Uh, he progressed his implementation, especially in, in the interest of um, core seed. Uh, so that confirms the overall uh, direction and content uh, of the draft. Nanti critical really find, uh, found and Cohen has also suggested some uh, some minor improvements, clarification, and proposal for minor um, 
additions that you can find also um, on the mailing list. Uh, we had progress also on the implementation of uh, PubSub. Uh, Hymas progressed uh, this implementation uh, also available uh, on the GitHub. And it was a whole team uh, working on implementation to support the Co-op API for um, developing uh, applications for, uh, for Co-op in the Riot OS. Uh, the work is still to, uh, to progress, but uh, you can find some code already on the GitHub and more details um, in the hackathon slide they presented, also linked uh, in this slide. Uh, this is uh, a summary of the next core interim meetings. Also um, anticipated uh, a few events uh, ago, uh, agreed uh, on the list and uh, sync with the CBOR uh, working group to keep alternating as usual. So core has the odd uh, weeks. Uh, we'll have the, the first next interim meeting uh, in two weeks from today, uh, basically. And honestly, we plan to have uh, the second one in this list in early December, um, only in case we have something urgent and very important to discuss that can come up uh, during the next weeks, um, especially considering that uh, it's holiday in Finland uh, that day. But then it should be pretty much regular um, in 2024. Uh, this concludes the summary from the chairs. So if there's no question or comment, we can get on the first agenda item from Kirsten. It's not that easy. I just have to open the request. I hope it works. Okay, good morning. Okay. Um, so I want to uh, quickly talk about uh, CallConf. Um, I don't think we, we have big decisions to make here at the moment. It, it's really uh, just working on the details. Just as a reminder, we have a published RFC with the Yang representation in CBOR. So people are looking at that in, in a lot of other working groups as well. Uh, but this is finished and uh, the, there's the, the one action that we are keeping in our mind is that maybe we want to have some uh, more compact forms of uh, items that are text-based in Yang. So for instance, if you have an uh, IPv6 address and represent this in Yang, you get a text-based representation, hexadecimal representation with interspersed uh, uh, colons. So, so that's something we may want to address. Um, but we, we do have a solid basis on, on which to do that. So the second document um, that, that is in the ISG now is concerned with allocating SIDS, Yang schema identifiers. So this doesn't have any um, interdependency with the Yang Seaboard definition, except that both agree that SIDs are 63-bit integers, 63-bit unsigned integers. But um, of course, the, the uh, extreme efficiency that Yang Sibo gives you um, is uh, to a large part based on being able to use SIDs instead of uh, full text-based path names as, as RESTCONF, for instance, um, does. So this has been on, on the back burner for about seven years. Um, and we have had extensive discussions with IANA. Uh, and uh, we are currently just trying to, to uh, get the ISG um, uh, on board with this. Uh, and we had a very good meeting on uh, Monday, uh, which uh, reused the number of discuss, discuss positions on this document to two from three, and let's see whether the other ADs find time to do this this week or maybe uh, next week. Uh, then the, the third thing, just like there are netconf for, for doing uh, Yang over SSH and restconf for doing Yang over HTTPS, uh, there is something called uh, Komai, which is uh, part of the coreconf picture and uh, is uh, Yang over Coab. So we have a uh, working group last call passed. Um, implementations are ongoing. 
And one feedback from those implementations I come to this is uh, we can still simplify this. And, and since we are the constrained uh, uh, RESTful environments group, we probably should take these uh, hints. And the fourth element is the uh, Yang library. Uh, originally, uh, NetConf had uh, something like an initial negotiation phase in which the, the server, which usually is the device and, and the client, agreed on which Yang modules are available. And this was replaced by something called the, the Yang library. Uh, and we didn't put any negotiation phase in, in uh, Komai, uh, of course, because we, we now do it uh, using a Yang library. Uh, but the Yang library that is uh, standard for Yang is way too complicated. And uh, so the idea was to have a simplified constraint uh, Yang library. We, we have a um, complete draft, it passed working plus call, but it seems inappropriate to advance this at this point in time uh, while the other things are being uh, worked on. So uh, call SID is number 23, not 22, um, and um, was uh, uh, submitted uh, during the uh, moratorium. Um, this addresses in particular the, the ISG uh, comments um, and in particular the, dis the discussed positions. Uh, I think we may need to spend a couple of days actually addressing the rest of the, uh, the comments, but those aren't in yet. Um, this was discussed in two ISG uh, meetings. Uh, you have to remember this whole SID scheme is, is quite innovative. Nobody has ever done something like that before. And uh, so it, it's understandable that, that ISG has questions. Um, so as I said, the number of discuss positions on, on blocking votes from the ISG ha has uh, gone from three to two um, this week, uh, mostly because uh, the, the, the AG actually agreed that, that certain consistency requirements he, he had in mind don't really work in this space because we have existing documents that, that are out there that define Yang modules and we have to deal with them and probably in a slightly different way than, than we deal with new documents. Um, so right now we, we are uh, still clarifying final, the final details of the SID publishing process. IANA seems to be on board, um, just have to, to do the remaining discussions with the ISG. Um, the, the other construction side uh, we had is uh, that, that P. Yang wasn't quite uh, conforming to this uh, document. Um, and uh, we, we started some P. Yang work. And uh, uh, then we had an interesting uh, situation where Laurent was uh, making some pull requests that GitHub showed him, but not me. So. Um, I'm not seeing his fork. I'm not seeing his pull requests. Everything is public, so nobody knows what's happening. We probably need next week to, to <laughs> solve this. Um, yeah, so this is the status of um, COSID. And this would be a good time to ask questions about COSID. So when, when this document is approved, the next step, of course, is to take uh, all those uh, specifications that already are referenced from CORSID. So we have some initial allocations of uh, SID ranges uh, that are already in that document. So we don't have to, to wait for the registry to actually be uh, uh, installed. And we can uh, start generating the SID files for those other documents as well. And Christian is on the in the queue. Uh, just a br brief question or not, uh, could at some point, given that this, now, this is now finishing, we have some venue where there could be a, uh, say, a tutorial, a tutorial introduction to recession because people have been, this has been around for quite, quite a yeah. lot of time, um, but people are coming into this working group who haven't kind of um, get the trickle down effect of seeing, seeing 10 years of presentations. And I think this would be useful to get kind of one intro session at some point. Thanks. Yeah, we, we can do this in Brisbane. We, we don't really know how, how uh, uh, big the, the take up of a session in Brisbane will be with uh, travel cost and time zones and so on. But of course, that would be recorded. Uh, we also could uh, just do something like an interim uh, to do this. 
So I have a great little slide set from Scott Mansfield, who told IEEE in July 2022, this is now as good as done, so we have to get our mega range. Uh, and he explained <laughs> the thing. Um, yeah, interesting uh, timing, but the, the good point. Okay, the, the um, other document, um, somebody has to take Christian off the queue when he doesn't do it itself. Um, the, the other document is the, the Komai document. Um, so how can, can we compete with NetConf and RESTConf? And ob obviously we don't want to do that. We want to do that, something that is appropriate for constrained devices. Um, and uh, the working plus call uh, ended uh, some six weeks ago, and uh, there's a little more implementer uh, feedback uh, uh, since. So what is this uh, Komai thing? Um, as I said, NetConf, the original Yang uh, protocol, Yang-based protocol, uh, essentially does Yang XML over SSH. It's uh, uh, kind of stuck on XML because the protocol also uses XML, not only the, the data that are encoded in Yang. Uh, RESTConf is Yang XML or Yang JSON over HTTP, and you definitely can use Yang Cibo uh, over HTTP, so you can do that today. Um, and CoreConf is Yang Cibo over uh, uh, CoAP. And uh, CoreConf re relies on Yang Sibo and the uh, management of the SID uh, space. So th there are essentially two emails that uh, you want to uh, read. Um, one is from uh, Kuhn, thank you. Um, so uh, Kuhn reports that, that uh, his implementation is going well, uh, but we still have opportunities for simplifying CoreConf. Um, and um, one thing that we, we could get rid of um, is a separate resource for doing full data store um, operations. So a full data store operation is essentially reading the whole Yang state of a device or instilling a completely new configuration uh, to the device in, in one uh, put. And uh, we could just map this to a fetch uh, uh, or eye patch of uh, SID0. And we probably should do that. SID0 has been reserved for this kind of um, uh, use. Uh, so that, that looks like a simplification, chopping off another five pages of, of document. Um, a comment that both Kuhn and Andy, which, who gets to the next slide, uh, made was that um, the semantics of uh, multiple RPCs or actions in one payload are not defined. So we should do something here. Uh, Andy comments that uh, we usually have uh, all or nothing semantics for something like that. And we probably should discuss whether constraint devices can do that. I mean, you can send a really complex set of updates in one piece and um, on one hand, this is exactly what you want. Don't want half the update to go through. On the other hand, that of course requires some rollback mechanism in the implementation that, that uh, may be uh, yeah, expensive uh, from an implementation point of view. You may have problems actually finding the memory for the rollback uh, state. So maybe that's something we actually can address using the Yang library. Uh, draft so so a server says whether it, it supports uh, all or nothing uh, semantics or not. So that, that's a discussion we have to have. And if you have an uh, opinion on this, it would be nice to hear it. And uh, when we uh, while we are doing this, there are still some editorial remnants of uh, things that we no longer need, and we can take them out. Okay, so let's uh, go on to Andy's uh, mail. Andy is a co-author, so it, it's a bit weird to have him respond to a working plus call, but of course you know that not all co-authors are uh, fully involved all the time, and Andy is a very busy person. Um, so we, we have a working plus call comment from a co-author, and um, 
he has uh, very good comments, some of which are editorial, having examples for each media type, for each new media type we are defining is, is absolutely required. Of course, we need to do that. Um, there is some, some confusion about what kind of data store uh, we are supporting. So we are not doing a full NIMDA set with current config and, and all this stuff. Uh, we are just providing a simple unified data store, which probably makes it even more important to have uh, all or nothing semantics. And uh, there, there are some references to NIMDA, the um, network management data store architecture. Is that the abbreviation, uh, the, the expansion of the abbreviation? I don't remember. Um, th th there are some, some remnants talking about NIMDA and, and Coma as defined is not meant uh, to do uh, NIMDA. Um, th there is a hack uh, in the document that simplifies instance identifiers and responses. And um, that may be another thing we, we can discuss. Um, so uh, in Yang, the, the schema nodes have SIDs, so that they are very easy to, to address. But a schema node may be something in a list. So if you have uh, five interfaces on your constraint device, maybe not, but um, you would have a list of interfaces and you have to say which interface you want to, to see the bit rate or whatever attribute of. So you complement the SID with a key. Sorry for using the word key, but that's the word that's being used. Um, <clears throat> so an instance identifier is a SID plus uh, optionally uh, one or more uh, keys. And the, que the, the question is, does a response really have to identify all these keys again? And right now it, it uh, identifies the top SID just to make sure that the Cibo Yang compression works right. So that, that's really the job um, of that information. But it, it's a simplification and it makes the, the actual response data structure not quite conforming to Yang because yeah, you would have to give the keys with the SID to really uh, say what, what this is about. Um, the RESTCONF has a filter parameter called depth uh, because you don't want to, to uh, uh, retrieve the, the entire universe in, in one get. Um, do we need that? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that, that's a feature request, uh, but uh, one we, we could be looking at in particular since we don't have the pagination uh, thing Yang by now has a pagination feature that allows you to split the response in, into multiple uh, pieces, and we only have blockwise for that, and that, that's hard to to operate from the um, or hard air to to, to uh, operate from the application there. I mentioned all or non semantics. Uh, there are some more editorial comments on examples. Um, there is something weird in the examples for RPC action responses. Uh, the, the leading zero doesn't make sense. Um, and we, we're probably simply going to fix that. And uh, then the, the old thing about uh, appendices. Some people think that appendices are by default informative. No, they aren't. But it doesn't hurt to, to say that again. And uh, so that, that's one of his editorial comments. So this will be probably another week or so of, of uh, uh, fixing the, the document to, to uh, incorporate all the working group uh, last call uh, comments. So the, the last call happened around IETF 1.17. Uh, um, Marco uh, put in a great review. These are addressed in the editor's copy and I only had slides for the things that are, uh, no, this is the wrong slide, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, there should be a slide here about the plan, but uh, I think it's obvious we want to put in these comments, uh, um, republish, and then maybe do another one week working group last call to, to make sure that everybody is on board. Okay, that was GORCONF. If there is no comment, then I go on to the next item on the agenda. Yeah, you're way into the href slot already, almost the end of it, but yes. it's only two slides. So it's it only two slides. So I, I think I can make this up here. 
Um, so uh, href is, a, is an ongoing uh, project that uh, we had a last call on, and that's where Marco's review was on, sorry. Uh, we are still in lack of test vectors. Uh, so that's really one piece of, of implementation work uh, that should be done. There are implementations of CRIs, but we don't have an agree set of uh, test vectors. So um, this probably should be done before we submit this to the uh, ISG. And um, I think the, the main thing that uh, can be reported here is uh, we started out with CRIs thinking we would support what we would find in COAP. So the, the COAP has its own URI encoding that is kind of smeared between various um, uh, COAP options. Um, then people came and said, oh, we can't really use this if we uh, have the, the danger that uh, one URI that we are trying to process um, does, uh, uh, does not get translated into a CRI. So we want to do a, a wholesale uh, replacement. Um, so we leaned into that direction and uh, maybe we swung the pendul pendulum too far and uh, we now have a form that is very explicit that the, the stuff you have to do to do a full UI support is an extension. It's not part of the base CRI set. So things like percent encoded um, uh, characters that cannot be resolved while, while ingesting a URI and turning it into a CRI, that is an extension. And uh, we, we thought we might simplify things a lot by that. We found out we will simplify things a bit uh, but not but not completely, but I think we are kind of accepting that and, and uh, can finish a draft based on this. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks. Um, by the way, there were comments in the chat from Alex Fang. Uh, I would appreciate to have an overview on core compensate. Um, is in the queue now. Alex. Um. Yeah. Hello, uh, Alex Wang in Salion. Um, yeah, I. It was regarding the comment uh, from I, Christian, and yeah, I, I I find it useful to have a tutorial somewhere, adding some reference to the right drafts and right RFC so that people can know okay which uh, which session is linked to each other. Uh, I find the SIP or SIT the young young SIT uh, are draft uh, quite clear to me but for example i was uh, i sent a unicast email to to karsten regarding how from a transport protocol and data plane could know if uh, this is encoded with young seats and and not so i think this kind of uh, like tweaks here and there could be very useful in a tutorial uh, and also presented on the on the core as I said in the in the chat, I am more interested in the Yang seat because I am implemented in NetConf the Yang push protocol. But yeah, uh, I support this idea basically. Thank you. Thanks. No? Any more questions or comments for Karsten on either set of documents? <laughs> None. Okay. Thanks, Karsten. Thank you. Um, next is Esco. Group Combis. Okay, thank you. Testing the mic. Okay, and a clicker, yeah. I'm just trying to have a look into the last call uh, that was mentioned for uh, CRI. I could not find it back in my mail, but <laughs> so it was already done, right? You were saying, or? Oh, not, maybe not, okay. Maybe I misread the slide and then and there was a date of July uh, on it for the last call. But Okay, never mind. We'll continue. So this is group uh, Combis. Has been around for some time uh, already. So I'm giving a short overview. Um, let's see. We have to press here. Is that... Uh... Never mind. I scroll. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just to recap, what is this document about? Well, we have um, an earlier experimental RFC, 7390. So this talks about group communication for co-op. And 
yeah, it's, it's just defined as an experimental RFC. So the idea was, well, we need something that is uh, normative so we can uh, reference it from the newer drafts like uh, Group Core. So that's what we've been uh, working on. So the idea is to obsolete the uh, predecessor RFC and in the meantime also add some yeah, good things or things that we found uh, to clarify and update in other RFCs like uh, Co-op 7252 and Observe as well, 7641. Uh, so this become, can become a new standards track reference for implementations that do Co-op group communication. I see there's a small mistake here in the scope uh, slide. So the scope is not only IP multicast based group communication, but we also talk about Co-op uh, group communication when used over other transports. So that's also uh, in scope. And the main uh, thing is that we now basically mandate security also for group communication. So in the form of uh, group or score. And we also provide details on uh, specific cases where you can't use security for some reason and, and yeah, explain uh, why that is, uh, uh, why it's not security in the case and why it has to be secured in all the other cases. And there are lots of more clarifications. Uh, so now it works. <laughs> Good. So I'm just reporting here what are the main updates since last time. Uh, I think it was presented with slides in the ITF. And I, I could find this one, ITF uh, 112. It was already a while ago. Um, so we're just saying what, what's new since then. Uh, so we have some new things uh, at the top. In the middle, we have some things that were clarified. And we have provided more details for uh, particular sections. So the new things, uh, there is now a new subsection appeared for, um, yeah, regarding proxies. So to do a single group request to multiple proxies. And there's also a transport section added. So what if we do uh, multicast over six low pan? Are there any specific con considerations for that case when you want to use co-op? group communication, and, and there are actually. So uh, one particular example is the fragmentation that happens in six slope on networks, which is typically bad uh, in combination with multicast. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, I think one important thing that's uh, clarified is now uh, terminology-wise. So um, yeah, we, we think we make a more clear separation between the different group types and also clarify what is exactly a group URI. And as I said, so when you can use co-op NOSEC, so the mode without security, uh, that's also clarified. Okay, then we did one recent update. This was uh, October 23, very recent. And this addresses uh, the comments of the review that was done by John. So he did a quite extensive review of the whole document again. And yeah, there's basically four main items that, that came out of it. They're listed here on the slide. So uh, these are all addressed, I think. Um, so in most cases, it was uh, rewording and clarification. And in case two, we actually added a specific use case for using the unsecured discoveries, which is uh, when you are using protocols for device onboarding. So that's typically when a new device comes into a, a network, a new domain that it doesn't know about. It has to be onboarded uh, and it has to discover, okay, what are devices here that can help me onboard? And there's no a priori security relation in that case. So then they will typically use unsecured discovery, which could be co-op discovery. Uh. So what are the next steps here? Um, so we had made that last update. Uh, we're now waiting for John and perhaps working group to confirm that these comments were addressed. Uh, we also had the working group last call done in April 22. And the review comments from that were also addressed. So we are just waiting for confirmation yeah, that these comments were indeed uh, well addressed. I think then uh, this document can move on in the process. 
unless we find other nice things to, to add, uh, like we were collecting <laughs> bits and pieces over the years and adding them, uh, which has also has been quite useful. But uh, at some point, yeah, you want to conclude, I think, with doing that. <laughs> I leave the rest to future documents. So here's just an overview of the open issues. So we, we do keep them in GitHub, uh, so there's no open issues. And one editorial pull request that uh, is already, I think, included in version 10, most of it. But I think we need to do one final check because I found at least one item that wasn't yet addressed. And But it looks all uh, very editorial, so we can, we can do that soon, I hope. OK, that's it. So if there are any questions, Feel free to ask. Any questions for Esco? Not in the chat, at least. If none, thanks a lot. No, OK, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Esco. Next to you. So hello everybody again. Um, the pub sub draft. Let's start right away. So I mean, I will skip some of the history, but this is a not new draft that has been there forever, um, and that uh, recently has been revamped and revived and uh, updated. So um, not major breaking changes with the previous ones, but uh, it will require some adaptation, some implementation, some you know some changes if you already have one. Um, high level overview, the idea is to have a co-op server which acts as a broker and stores uh, topic resources and then the co-op clients act as publishers and subscribers and then um, they, they publish on a topic data resource and then they subscribe to the same topic data resource using co-op observer, that's the high level overview. Um, the, there is two types of resources let's say on the broker that the, the structure is that of a topic collection from which you have topic configuration resources hang, hanging uh, those topic configurations are usually for they are they're used for administrative purposes so creating the 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 topic structure um, uh, configuring the topic uh, you know configuring the properties of the topic whether you have um, these many subscribers that many subscribers support it and so on and uh, well, you can see there the, the operations. I'm not gonna, I mean, this was already presented in the previous uh, ITF, so I'm not, not gonna go in detail on that. But basically, from that topic configuration, you have one topic, uh, one property called topic data, which is the place where you actually do the pub sub operations. So it's, that's the actual resource that you need to discover in order to publish and subscribe. Um, the one concept that some people have told me about that they were intrigued is the lifecycle part. So because we have a topic configuration and the topic data, um, when you delete a topic data resource, which is an entry within the topic configuration, you don't necessarily delete the whole topic. You go back to what we call half created state. So you have the half created and the fully created. And this basically means that a topic only really exists if it has, the topic configuration has been created a topic data exists and somebody has published something on that. Then at that point, you can subscribe on it and it behaves like a, uh, you know, the usual pops up type of uh, behavior. And there you have the example. So on, on the left side, you have the topic creation part on a post on, a, on the collection resource, which is not hard coded or anything. It just happens to be a slash PS, but it could be whatever, um, whatever path, I mean. Um, and then you go back uh, the handler for that particular topic configuration. And within the fields that you have created, in which you have the properties I mentioned before, you have the topic data. And then, and this operation, by the way, I didn't mention that, but that, that should be done probably by some sort of administrative entity or, you know, someone that actually handles the topics and so on. While the pops up part is done by the application. So you get the topic data uh, path hosted at the broker, and then you can uh, do uh, publish and subscribe on it. And that's basically the, the whole thing. Um, so what is the new thing? So on the, on the implementation side, so the, during the, the last couple of hackathons basically implemented a version of this on top of IO co-op, which of course, <laughs> without it, it wouldn't be possible. 
Um, and then the, the main thing is that in this ITF, I implemented the, well, I did updates on the spec, which I will mention at the end, sorry for that. Uh, but I implemented the eye patch for updating, partially updating the topic configuration, fetch on the topic collection. I actually did delete because for some reason I forgot it the last time, I don't know why. And then, um, yeah, uh, RT-based discovery and other discovery things. And just few few updates here and there. So, but it's usable. And as I said in the previous ITF also, like it's probably easier to just go to the open source repo there and checking it out than to read the whole 30 pages document. It's faster. So what, what we promised uh, in the last ITF for this version was to check the, all of these fields, IANA, blah, 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 and all that. Um, so this is what has been accomplished for this version. So we, we do have now uh, IANA section, the use of max H, so the, basically for rate limiting. Um, yeah, it, it was not done properly, so actually that, that section was rewritten as well. Security section, thanks with the input from Marco, actually, in the reviews. I will mention that later as well, but like the security section is, is now there more or less in shape. Using the of Seabor in the implementation, which basically means plugging in the library. Um, yeah, implementing the operations I mentioned before. Yeah, added the observer check field. So when you have subscribers, um, so when you, when you have subscribers to a topic, the broker needs to sometimes tweak this field in order to regulate idle subscribers because it could it could happen that you have hundred subscribers a thousand or whatever, and half of them are totally idle and they don't care anymore about the notification. So you, this will allow you to, to quickly see that situation and, and fix it from the broker point of view. And then, um, yeah, the, we added the, on the document, we added the topic collection discovery. Um, add the updates to, to examples, added more examples. At least I like examples on the document because it's much easier to understand. So this one has plenty. Um, yeah, there were some issues in the issue tracker from the, the so document issues from really way back. Um, I replied to some of them. I think I didn't get replies back. I don't know who, if the, those authoring those issues are following this anymore. But um, yeah, I, in, some of those were, were valid and actually triggered uh, edits in the document. So thanks for that. Belated, very belated thanks to, to the commenters. And then uh, we, I got two really good reviews. Um, one from uh, Marco, which is now a contributor of the document. Thank you so much for that. And from Oscar. And then m reviews of little parts here and there. But I would like much more comprehensive reviews now that the document is more stable. Now then, the one of the topics that we thought could be nice to add, but that I would be leaning towards not adding it, is the hosting of data resources elsewhere than in the broker. And I'll explain that in a moment. So I'm referring to this. So I even started drafting it and all that. And but the, So you can have the topic data resource normally at the broker. If you host it on a different server, the problem is that you need to keep a lot of state now between that server and the, and the broker for that particular, to, for each topic configuration. And then that will require more protocol stuff, more messaging. And in, in general, it's something that it sounds great. And in this document, we should definitely have the capabilities for that type of extension. But in my opinion, it should, should go on a different document, not to overload this one. At least that's my take on it. Um, uh, Karsten, you seem eager. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <clears throat> We discussed this, and um, I think what we came up with is that a client of the PubSub protocol, a subscriber, a client of the PubSub protocol, a subscriber, uh, should uh, expect the topic data resource to be on a different server. So that's part of the protocol right now. If you go back one slide, um, yeah, um, that line between the, the, the one chip and the other chip, that is not defined. And that is easy to add as a separate document. I wouldn't even call this an extension because the, the, the PubSub interface doesn't change. It's, we just now have a way, a standard way uh, for a, a topic data holder to communicate with a, a broker. 
but you could do this with a proprietary uh, mechanism today. So, so you can still have this situation and uh, subscribers should be prepared to, to find it that way. I, I agree with that, yes. I phrase it differently, but I agree. Sorry? Yeah, well, so publishers will ha maybe have to take part in this protocol. So I think we, we can guarantee compatibility on the subscriber part. I'm not so sure about the publishers. Uh, David, you're in the queue. All right. David Navo, uh, I have a question on the scope of this work. So when once heard about uh, publish subscribe, he, one can help to think about uh, MQTT and uh, use cases and deployment of MQTT are using, let's to be conservative, hundreds of publishers and subscribers and hundreds of topics. Can you come closer? Sorry. Sorry. It's uh, really windy here. I mean, I really don't hear it. Need to be really close to the mic. So yes, um, and is it the the scope of this uh, of this document, or are you planning for something much more constrained? Or, I'm or, well. Or is, from, it's not a consideration at all. Um, so the. Can, can you rephrase the question again? Well, because I didn't well, follow the relation with MQTT. Well. Uh, um, Let's say if I were to use a co op pub sub to replace scenario where I'm, uh, where I'm using MQTT, mm -hmm. currently I have the feeling that I will face a scalability problem. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, for instance, in the topic discovery, when you are using MQTT, a publisher will out of band tell you, I will publish my data on this particular topic. And for the subscriber, it's you just have to say, I'm subscribing to this topic. With the current mechanism, you have to do a discovery of the mm -hmm. existing topics. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding, you have to inspect uh, all the configuration to find the topic which match the mm -hmm. right no, description you, or name. No, no, no. You, you can do fetch on the topic collection based on whatever thing yeah. you're looking for. But you can do, uh, sorry. Um, I think I would disagree with the authors here. Um, right. When uh, in that situation where the publisher communicates to the subscriber the topic, I'm not sure whether they should really communicate the topic and then let the subscriber get around to fetch, but just co um, communicate the topic data resource. I think that would be something they can do. So just to clarify, when I say, I mean, I meant topic configuration resource, not the topic data. You're right. Like you can do on the topic collection resource, let's say you want to find uh, based on the name field of the property, you could do discovery based on that. So you don't need to discover the whole thing. You can select a subset if you wish. But yeah, I mean, in, in co-op, discovery is a feature. OK, that is so necessary. I missed that. So, OK, yeah. thank you. And yeah, uh, I had another question on the, the process of the topic creation. Yep. This is also, and to answer also a question, in the MQTT use cases, you you don't have you are not fully aware of the the timing of things you don't know if the publisher will appear before the subscriber or right or the other way around so topics are implicitly created by uh a, the first subscription or the first publication and i'm wondering with this uh, creation step that is introduced if um uh, if this yeah. is still possible. So well, I guess from what you just an answered, you will do a discovery. And if you can't find the topic that you are interested in, you can create, even yes. if you are just a subscriber. Right? Yes. And of course, that creation optimization, I mean, the creation process could be optimized. You could do a post with the topic uh, resources that you, that you like. Mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, do a, some sort of configuration step in which the topic data is already populated. But you need to have some resource representation there, otherwise you get 404, because there is nothing there from the core point of view. So the URI is present, but there is no actual data. So I don't know. I mean, I, I am open for suggestions how to fix that, by the way, if anybody else has comments. OK, so just to say, the, to sum up my comments, 
I'm worried of the ease of use of right. this protocol compared to what currently exists in MQTT. And that mm -hmm. you will most of the time compete with. Yeah, I mean, on the competition side, if that I, I don't know. I mean, it's a very hard question to, to yeah. answer right now. But we can discuss offline on that if you sure. want. I don't have uh, a very good answer right now. OK, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, Christian, you're still in the queue. Do you want to say something? OK. All right. Um, so, I mean, if there is no more comments, what I would, what I was hoping for was to get um, more reviews, more thorough reviews, um, because I don't expect huge changes on the document, but they could be, I mean, depending on the input of the reviews, of course, but uh, I would say that we are now in a more mature stage with this and that we should try to move it forward. So if anybody wants to volunteer, please ping me. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamid. And we're also right on time. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm talking about TNS over uh, Coop, and I'm Martin Lenders. Um, I just give a short introduction for those who don't know about uh, DNS over co-op. The motivation is, of course, to encrypt uh, DNS uh, requests and responses. And uh, yeah, uh, we decided to use DNS over co-op because we have the encryption com encrypted communication based on DTLS and OSCOR. We also have blockwise transfer to overcome a pass MTU problem we have with DNS over DTLS, and we are able to share system resource with co-op applications, which of, co which of course gives us uh, some resource advantages. Um, just a note, our research paper on this topic is published. Um, you can read it in the proceedings of the ACM on networking, um, and I will present it in December at Conext. Uh, so if you want to read it, please do. Um, since the last ITF, we didn't change much on the draft. Um, we amended the introduction to have a short context contextualization of constrained environments and also added our research paper to the appendix. Um, there is still some open discussion regarding service B records. Um, there was a recommendation by Ben Schwartz to add a section on that, how to bootstrap DNS over the uh, DOC, uh, over Service B records. Um, but there is still some work needed because uh, there is currently no ALPN record for DTLS and also there's no Service B description for OSCO. And I think Christian may also talk a little bit later about this, that there's also in, in other areas some interest in Service B records. So um, we think that overall the uh, doc draft is not the right place for uh, this. So the question is, should we maybe start a draft on uh, this topic? To, um, and the other open discussion was the question of cacheable Oscar. There was some uh, feedback from Marco um, that we talked a lot about cacheability and OSCOR in the draft, but we never actually referenced the cacheable OSCOR draft, but this is now fixed because in the editor's copy on GitHub, the PR was merged yesterday uh, to the, uh, uh, on the topic. Um, so given that we have one discussion topic where we think that it doesn't really belong into the draft and uh, one uh, discussion topic that is already resolved. Uh, our question is if this can go into working group last call. Justin Bormann, has anybody implemented this? Ah, yeah, uh, we have two implementations, a client implementation in Riot and a server implementation in Python. Okay, and uh, is, is there any feedback from those implementers? Um, the, the implementer is me, so um, yeah, maybe uh, some more implementations would be helpful then for other people to look into the draft, yeah. So, so is, is there anybody in this room who would be 
interested in implementing this? Laurent? Yes, Laurent? Laurent. Yeah. Okay, would be good to hear soon from you so we can use that information in the working class group. And could you move back to slide seven? Which one? Uh, seven, the previous one. Seven is this one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, uh, as the, uh, uh, yeah, okay, the, uh, just move. This yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was discussing a little bit about this with um, Christian yesterday. And okay. this can be taken incrementally uh, in the interest of the document. So the, the first step uh, as the most reasonable one can be adding text, probably summarizing this current status that you have in this slide. And yeah, ideally uh, have an informative reference to a new document that can be limited to a problem statement of what would be needed to be worked out to, to fill the gaps. And mm -hmm. if this is going to work as good enough, that would be it. If, if more requests come to be, yeah, to develop something more in that direction, well, uh, we do that uh, if we're asked for. Yeah. How does that sound? Um, I didn't understand the last part, actually, even though you stand directly beside me. <laughs> so let, let's not do uh, more than anything that is um, sufficient to hopefully uh, calm any possible objection or question. If they come, we can take some step more. But yeah, yeah given this external problem statement to be referred here informatively uh, is probably good enough uh, at this stage. Okay. And, then, and for what is worth, I think is something that can even be addressed in the process of working group class call, uh, whenever it happens. Okay, then yeah, maybe I, we sit together with Christian and talk about this problem statement. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Then thank you. Thank you. Also for being so efficient. <laughs> So next is uh, Ricard presenting remotely, and I can actually try to give you control of the slides, Ricard. Sounds good. Um, okay. You should yeah. have it now. You should be in control. Yep, looks good. Looks like I have control. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, hello, everyone. Today I will be presenting updates on this draft key update for OSCORE which is about a, um, a key update solution for OSCORE, as the name implies. So just to recap, um, this draft originally it had three parts. As you can see, we split out the middle part, which was more details on uh, key usage limits. And uh, based on previous discussions, this now lives in a separate document, uh, the ITF uh, core OSCORE key limits. So the two remaining parts is defining the key update solution. And what is this about? Well, it's about renewing the master secret and master salt and thus deriving new sender and recipient keys. And yeah, it's loosely inspired from OSCOR Appendix B2. And uh, we have some benefits here. Uh, one is that we can achieve perfect forward secrecy. And secondly, we have no change in the ID context parameter that OSCOR uses. And then the second part is um, we also have a, a, a method in this draft defining how you can perform uh, updates of the OSCOR sender and recipient IDs. And this can be good um, for privacy reasons in certain situations. Here you can see an overview. So essentially the, the kudos, the key update procedure is based on an exchange of nonces. And these nonces are placed in new fields in the OSCOR co-op option, which we have extended. Um, then we also have this update CTX function that practically performs the, the update of the master secret and master salt based on the nonces and um, additional input material. And if, if you see here in the bottom left how we updated the OSCOR option, you can see that we extended it with an X byte that contains some signaling flags and the length of the nonce. And following the X byte, we have a, a field to actually hold the nonce. And in this latest version, and I will come back to this, we also extended this further to define a 
old nouns field and an associated y byte that defines the length of that old nouns field. And this is because in certain messages we need to transport two nonces and then they need to be actually placed in separate fields so that we can um, well tell them apart and, and extract them independently from each other. So to go over some updates from uh, ITF 117, um, one thing that we did now is that we have mandated support for both, both the forward and reverse message flow. So essentially the um, kudos procedure, either the client can take the initiative to start it, and that's the forward message flow, or the server side can take the initiative to start it, starting with an actual response message, and that's the reverse message flow. And we now mandate that peers must support those both flows, and this is basically to avoid the risk of deadlock situations where if they support the different flows, they will be incompatible with each other. We also clarified the definition of a kudos message. Uh, it wasn't um, exactly accurate before, but basically if the D flag bit is set, uh, that is the signal that indicates that this is, an, uh, that this is a kudos message. Uh, we also updated in the draft, we also have a list of like existing methods for a key update for OSCOR. Uh, and we now added also the, the ad hoc in OSCOR profile of ACE as a possible method for uh, the key. Some further updates. So kudos can be run in two modes. Uh, one mode ensuring forward secrecy and also a no forward secrecy mode that is meant for very constrained devices that are unable to store um, information on uh, non volatile memory. Um, and we also define two classes of devices, capable devices, which can store information in non volatile memory and non capable devices, which cannot store information on non volatile memory. So basically what we did here is also again to avoid deadlock um, situations. We now say that if a device is capable, meaning it can store information in vol uh, non volatile memory, well, it definitely should support the forward secrecy mode, but in addition, it must also support the no FS mode. And again, this is to, pro to avoid any kind of risk of mismatch or deadlocks. Uh, we elaborated a bit more on the mode selection because when kudos is executed, we have a signaling bit in the X byte that indicates whether the mode that this particular pair wishes to run kudos in. And we have added some additional criteria um, for how to proceed if the, these bits are set to different values, meaning the peers are wishing to run kudos in, in different modes, then they can retry and uh, reattempt to run kudos. So for instance, if, if one only supports a no forward secrecy mode and the initiator wants to run the forward secrecy mode, if that initial execution fails, well, then the, the initiator can retry again in the no uh, forward secrecy mode. We also now explicitly forbid using old key material after reboot. This is just to make it very clear that if you reboot, you must uh, perform a kudos execution before commencing OSCOR communication. And this is to avoid uh, nonce and key use. An exception is if you have some means to do this safely, such as the OSCOR Appendix B1 procedure, which is based on saving your latest um, sender sequence number. Uh, yeah, so this coming back to the update to the OSCOR option um, to allow transporting the N1 nonce in the reverse flow. Um, we have extended the OSCOR option to have this Y field and the old nonce field. And essentially, the reason for this is that in the reverse flow, in the second request, we need to include the, the nonce one such that um, the receiver of this can retrieve the correct kudos execution. And the way we had it, we just concatenated N1 and N2 in the nonce field, but we realized that's not sufficient because it leaves room for ambiguity. And especially when the nonce lengths differ, we really need these in separate fields so they can be extracted as separate uh, values. Uh, so to come into some open points, one open point that was raised um, in a mail from Christian originally, it was suggested that we may want to have a allowance for a more flexible message flow. So the way we have things now is um, in the forward flow, we have a kudos request followed by a kudos response. And in the reverse flow, we have a, we have a kudos response followed by a kudos request. 
So the solution is always based on like pairs of requests and responses in a sense. Now the question becomes, is that really necessary or can we allow for a, even more uh, flexible ways of running kudos? So Christian proposed the scenario based on the resource directory where you can see that message one goes from the endpoint to the resource directory and that's a, um, a call request. And then the second message is from the resource directory to the endpoint which is also a core request. So why couldn't it be possible to also run kudos um, based on using two requests and not a request response pair? Technically, there shouldn't be anything that, that's stopping that. And there can also be other scenarios possible. For instance, the second kudos message can be a response to a different request than the first kudos message. So you don't have a request response pair. Maybe you have a request and then you have a, a notification unrelated notification coming back. And that will act as a second kudos message. So we're kind of decoupling the idea of kudos from this re strict request response pairing and making it more flexible. Uh, so this was a suggestion that was brought up. And uh, yeah, we're very open to any feedback on that or, or thoughts if that's a, a good direction to take. Yeah, I go to the next one. So. Um, Another related point was, um, can we make kudos messages just be regular application messages? And what do I mean by that? Well, currently the way things are defined is that kudos messages are a special types of messages. Meaning if a client wishes to initiate kudos, the request that it sends is to a special uh, resource, the well-known kudos resource and without any payload. But the question becomes, well, why can't, if the client is wanting to send a request to the server to retrieve the resource representation, why can't that request then also at the same time serve as a kudos message? Meaning that the client initiates kudos with a normal application message uh, when it wants to already send a, a request to the server. Now, of course, that doesn't stop. Like if the client at that point doesn't want to send a request to the server, it can still um, um, make itself send a request just to, to execute kudos. But if it's either way, uh, already wants to do a request to a resource at the server, it, this might also then serve as a kudos message. Uh, so what are the implications of this? Well, first of all, it means that uh, a kudos request message can target any resource at the server. It doesn't have to go to well-known kudos. And it also means that in the folder message flow, the client would send the application message that it currently wants to send and make that a kudos message. Now, the caveat on this is that the server cannot be sure that this request is fresh. Uh, so then it may want to respond with a 401. Uh, and But the thing is that this can in turn signal to the client to rerun kudos. So you have this issue with freshness, but that's really the same issue as um, you would otherwise have um, sorry, I'm getting some echo from the room. I don't know if you can mute someone there or, yeah. So this was also another open point we have. And again, we're, we're all welcome to any feedback or comments on this. Uh, Kristen, I'm just, I just like to briefly point out that implement you mentioned B, the appendix B1 before, implementations that do B1 already have, kind of already have to understand the situation of a request possibly not being fresh and like dealing with that situation. So I think that's already well understood in Oscar. In Oscar. Yeah, yeah, right. That's exactly like, it, that should already be possible to solve with like mechanisms already existing for Oscar and core. Uh, Esko? Yeah. Hello, uh, Esko Dag. The question, uh, so uh, if you want to combine this thing like a kudos message and an application message, uh, maybe to consider if that's worth the effort is, is thinking about how often does this kudos message need to be sent. So I don't know if it's only the rekeying, it's only once every, um, yeah, I don't know, every month or so, then it might not be worth the trouble to to try to piggyback that into application messages because <laughs> it can give a lot of complexity as well. Uh, 
I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the frequency would depend, I suppose, on uh, policies or, or that particular setup. Um, but sure, it, it, would, it may add some uh, complexity. Uh, on the other hand, it may be nice to merge these concepts together in the sense that the, the kudos processing can really happen before the actual remainder of the message is forwarded to the resource. Um, but yeah, this is an, um, a possible way. Yeah, if you can really separate it, then it maybe becomes easy. But if there's some corner cases, then, then I would say, okay, don't <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> Just keep it things simple because we don't want code for corner cases in constrained devices, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. Yeah, so I move on. Another point that was opened was the point about uh, using non-random nonces. So the way we have things phrased now, we always speak about the nonces as random values. Uh, but it was pointed out that in some scenarios, using counters may actually make sense. Uh, and this is the case where you have a capable device, which is can actually persist the context over reboots. And thus, it can also persist the counter over reboots. And of course, the important thing there is that the counter value is never used. Uh, so the, well, the question is, shall we also allow, explicitly allow in the text, um, using counters as nonces? Um, currently, we don't really forbid it explicitly or allow it for explicitly. Although we have this language about saying random nonsense. Um, I mean, taking those grace profiles example, there they use uh, what they state there is that the use of a 64 bit long random number as a nonce value is recommended. So, our proposed solution here would be that what we can say is that uh, non capable devices, which are unable to store the counter value to disk and persist it, they must use random values for the nonces. Uh, when it comes to capable devices, they should use random values, but they may use counters if they can enforce a uh, measure to ensure their freshness and also accept the privacy implications because there are some privacy implications of using uh, counters instead. So it would allow it, but we still say that you should use random values. So yeah, any, any thoughts or feedback on this is also welcome. Yeah, let me move to the to the last point. So this is about the, like I mentioned before, the draft really contains, I would say, two separate topics. One is about QS itself, and the other is a method for updating the OSCOR send and recipient ID, which is contained in Section 5 and Appendix A. And overall, these span around 16 pages of the document. So. And this IDAP procedure is really a, a standalone procedure, although you can integrate it with kudos. Um, so we raised this in the past. The question is, should we split out this section about the OSCAR ID update to a separate working group document? Uh, this was raised in the past without any strong consensus um, to proceed forward with that. Um, the benefit would be that it can focus this document more specifically on kudos. Uh, so we wanted to raise this again to get the feeling from the group if we should go ahead or if we should hold off um, hold off with doing this, basically. Yeah, I see some comments in the chat there. Uh, Karsten, I think you still wanted to form an opinion exactly on this point. Do you have an opinion now? <laughs> <clears throat> Splitting a document is inexpensive, uh, so uh, if, if it has a benefit, uh, we should do it. Um, I wonder what, what what is that creature that actually only has to, has to read one of the two documents in the end? At least I, at least I could barely hear you. We really need to hit the mic, I'm afraid. Yes. So. I, I'm still hunting for the creature that actually only reads, has to read one of the two. Then it would be worth splitting it. 
Uh, Ricard, please take it. Yeah, so you're saying basically that why would you, like if you're interested in ID update, you would regardless be interested in the in the kudos procedure. I suppose if you have, if you're using some other mechanism for key update or you're, um, maybe you, you're, you're using ad hoc or something like that, you may only be interested in the ID update uh, procedure uh, in isolation. Uh, there's Joran in the queue. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Sorry, I got, got a little bit of a cold. <clears throat> uh, I think we're, I think the argument makes sense about um, people who bo probably read both uh, documents, but I think the document, Kudos is now growing a little bit uh, big, and, and that might be a reason why we actually want to get the pages down. Uh, sorry, Joram, please try to speak closer to the mic. We oh, can barely okay. hear you. Can you hear me now? A bit better. Okay, I'm as close as I can, I think. I can speak louder. So I was just saying that I think I think we should split out the, uh, the Oscar IDs, if not for the, the reason that Kudos is already a kind of a large document and we'd like to reduce it as much as possible. And uh, this is a separate func function that doesn't have to be in this document. That's my proposal. Was it loud enough? Yeah, here I can hear you very well, actually. Uh, it's online, there's no problem. Okay, I, I write in the chat instead. But yeah, that would be a benefit, I suppose, that uh, as you mentioned that, okay, it reduces the complexity of Kudos. Uh, that's like a side benefit of Kudos itself. The Kudos document becomes shorter and more focused, yes. Well, let me wrap it up. So as for summary and next steps, well, we will address these open points that were brought up today. Um, we also plan to start an implementation and otherwise just proceed with the uh, work on open issues and all our issues we have are, are listed as issues on, on the GitHub repository of the draft. And again, yeah, any comments um, or feedback are very welcome. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Any more <laughs> comments or questions, anyone? Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, then the next in line is uh, Giuseppe with co-op performance measurement. Okay, it works. Okay, hello everybody. This is an update about the co-op performance measurement option. Uh, this is the 01 version and uh, the draft has been adopted a few months ago. So I'm presenting on behalf of the co-authors that you can see listed in the slides. Um, now, what is the motivation? So uh, we propose this work to find a new mechanism to measure the performance in co-op. Uh, since it is resource consuming to make performance measurement in constrained environment, we need straightforward methodologies. In IPPM, there, uh, we are working on uh, explicit flow measurement techniques that employ few marking bits inside the header of each packet for loss and delay measurements. These are described in RFC uh, 9506 that has been just published a few weeks ago. So this is the last the, the, the news. Uh, um, I just want to uh, describe a few of these bit methodology. Maybe some of you uh, already knows there because are optional in quick protocol, like the spin bit idea that um, it aims to create a square wave signal on the data flow using a bit whose length is equal to the round trip time. In this way, you can measure easily the round trip time with a very simple algorithm. And it is optional in quick. It is explained in the RFC 9000 and RFC 9312. While the square bit create a square waves um, as defined in RFC 9341 that can be used for packet loss measurement. 
So both methodology are proposed standards, so are stable methodology. That, that's why I want to highlight this point. Uh, basically, this draft proposes a new option for co-op to carry these bits, spin bit or square bit. Um, we uh, the, the option value can be defined with the following bits, so square bit, spin bit, or a combined between these two bits, or since we have space, we can also use event bits. Uh, we can also introduce new patterns according to the methods of RFC 9506. Um, I want to clarify that for now we have made a proposal about the option, but we are working on an implementation. So in order to compare the different combinations and according to the result, we aim to decide which option we can uh, standardize together with the working group. So hopefully for the next interim or uh, session, we can have some uh, implementation results that uh, we can share with you. Regarding the application scenarios, um, we explain different cases, the non-proxying endpoints or collaborating endpoints or non-collaborating proxying or collaborating proxy. In case of non-proxy endpoints, this is the simple case. So we have just client server with a possible probe in the middle and the option can be applied end to end and um, uh, it allow end-to-end -end measurement or on-path measurement on the probe and uh, on-path intra-domain if you have more than one probe, for example. In case of collaborating proxies, so it means that the proxy are allowed to handle the option. Uh, the option can be applied end-to-end -end between client server or between the collaborating proxies. In this case, you can make measurement between client server, the two proxies, proxy and server, or on path if you have probe in the middle. In case of non-collaborating proxies, of course, the things became a little bit uh, difficult because the since the option is defined as proxy and safe, um, if there are non-collaborating and caching proxy, the measurement is not possible. But we explain, so this point can also be further discussed maybe later uh, and during the progress of the document. But for now, we state that an implementation may consider the option as safe to forward if the proxies are non-caching. In this case, the measurement is still possible, uh, of course, end-to-end -end or on path between the client and server. Again, uh, the, the proxies need to be non-collaborating, but non-caching. So the, it's important that we have non-caching proxies. Uh, the draft also explains what happens in case of DTLS and OSCOR. Of course, when a client uses a collaborating pro proxies using DTLS, uh, it can be still measurement, but an on-prat probe cannot perform the measurement, of course. In case of OSCOR, uh, the endpoints send both outer and inner option. The inner is for measuring, can be used for measuring, for example, the connection uh, to the end-to-end -end peer, while the outer option can be used for measuring the connection to the next proxy. This is just to explain the possible scenarios. Uh, what are the next steps? Uh, um, as I said, we are working on an implementation, so we hope to have some results and some, uh, I think what is can be more interesting is to have some comparative result between the different bits combination and so on. Um, it is based on well-known methodologies apply uh, in spin bit and square bit. Also, let's say the the base document that describes the methodologies has been just published, so it's also, let's say, quite stable, we, we can say. So we are looking forward to share uh, much more information about the implementation. So, and if you are also interested to implement, we are open to discuss. So welcome question and come. Thank you. Okay, Lanzuta, I have maybe a stupid question, but why don't you encode this in the message ID or in the token value? You have a bit and the source. 
can choose the value it sends in the token or message ID, and you can make uh, this bit fluctuating in, in this information. Mm, yeah, we believe that the option maybe is better because you can attach to each packet. So, and you can do the same with through token. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we. Just a comment. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Now, I don't know, we, we can consider. So, um, we, we just con consider the flexibility of co op to have an option. And since the option can be attached to each packet, so we believe that. And, and since uh, this methodology needs information for each packet, so because we are, we are monitoring each packet, so and the square wave is covering all the flow, so that's why we, we believe that it may be a good choice. But. Uh, Carsten Bormann, yeah, I think the discussion about the unsafe bit is one possible answer. Uh, so the, the marking the option as unsafe makes sure that you don't measure something you cannot measure. Mm. Yeah, this is also true, yeah. <coughs> Looks like Christian has a comment. <laughs> Just, um, just coming back to the message ID and token, um, yes, you don't have control, full control over the message ID of each message, but then again, you can also not attach an option to each um, co-op message that is being sent. So, being sent. so as soon as there, are, um, as there are empty acknowledgements in there, um, you cannot accept, add an option there, mm. just so that you kind of keep track of that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I just have a few suggestions for, for the document. Um, there's a section where you discuss the, the bits in, in detail and their computation. And about the bit um, C, you say that it, it's the logical combination of Q and S, yeah. but that you describe how to compute it, uh, taking as input Q and D, where D is not used in this document, but comes from Yeah, because one. it's defined in right. the other documents. Yeah. But, but to, to make this document self-contained, okay, uh, I will describe how to compute Q, um, sorry, C, uh, from Q and S as the mm. bits uh, in yeah, this document. Yeah, yeah. At least it's self-contained, and one doesn't necessarily need to, to get uh, to that other document. Yeah, yeah okay. And, and then it would be good to have um, examples, uh, even as an appendix, uh, of the different application scenarios with a few uh, messages exchanged, showing how the bits change and what kind of measurement we produce. Okay. Uh, in the same spirit of those examples we were uh, drawing on the on the notes at some interim meeting a few times ago with Christian to decide about the uh, to decide about the option uh, uh, nature actually but still uh, and then I have a question um, on uh, how much if at all this is applicable to group communication uh, I suspect it has the same limitation of sporadic traffic and observe where it doesn't really work because you, you really need, uh, need um, um, a constant sequence of request response pair. The multiple responses are um, a disturbance here, like in the case mm. of observe. So please think about that. If that's the yeah. case, maybe it's worth some considerations uh, in the same lines of, of the case for observe and sporadic traffic. Yeah, yeah for, for the first point, of course, I will revise to the text okay. to uh, to align the description and to make the document self-contained, of course. Um, regarding uh, your question on group communication, I also am not, I'm not sure if all the bits can work. Maybe some, for example, the marking bits may work, but that, that's why we, we am, and regarding also the appendix, maybe with some example of message exchange, maybe since we will work on implementation and so I think that will help to have good result to answer this question uh, if it works with group communication and also if we can um, add much more detail about implementation and the message exchange. So this will help because we can, re let's say, touch really co-op environment, co-op situation. And uh, yeah, I hope we can have some result for an interim or for Brisbane so to share. Looking forward. Okay. Thank you. 
And again, if uh, someone is also interested to the implementation, we are happy to further discuss and thank you. Okay, um, next one is Christian with two slots back to back that he may want to combine. <laughs> yep, hello. Um, just, um, just, just on, on, on the two slots, um, if it turns out that this takes longer than Greece, then uh, so be it. Um, I think this is the higher, higher priority uh, topic. Um, so we've had a think to thing research group um, a meeting on Friday. And the co-op topics kind of all spiraled around naming things, which is known to be one of the three hard problems in NIT. Um, so this has a few bits of like the, the, the core of this presentation will be focused on transport indication because this is where a lot of the naming happens, where the use cases come from co-op over GAT, uh, from, from the um, draft on Onion co-op, and they also interact with the reverse proxy setup that we do in, in resource directory extensions. Um, I'd like to start with a bit of history, which I usually kind of try to avoid, but I think in this case it is relevant. Um, the origin of, the, of some of the naming discussions, um, some might say the original sin, but I would say no, because it's like it's, it was the best thing we could do at that time. Uh, was the introduction of the of the scheme of the protocol in the scheme um, in RFC eight two uh, eight three two three, which was controversial back at the time, but um, yeah, it, it it was the best we could do with the tools we had back then. So from that, um, in in parallel with this with uh, what became eight three two three, there was uh, there was work on how do we negotiate which protocols we use, which um, somehow kind of got. Uh, got stalled, um, but the gist there was still that we use co-op plus something for everything that comes up later, and things are coming up later. So um, uh, Slipmux, which is co-op over UART, has been expired for some time, but it's still a valuable example of how this could be done, and I hope that it would be revived. Uh, co-op over GAT is a document that I've presented occasionally in this working group, and that so far specifies co-op plus GAT colon slash slash and while co-op over SMS has expired, it is also one of the one of the kind of cases where it's described as co-op plus something, colon slash slash etc. Um, to to clean this up and also to can, to have something that we can present to the larger ITF onto how we deal with the confusion that comes out of that plus. Um, the protocol negotiation efforts were rebooted as transport indication, and in the current state, and I hope also the future state, because I'm still convinced that this is the way to go, uh, rely on indicate uh, on links between um, the the resources and the proxies that you could use uh, to access them. And the proxy kind of in in its transport um, in in its URI also encodes how with which protocol you actually get there. There are a few more documents, or like two related documents actually that I'm working on that also deal with names more on the side of cryptographic identifiers. Uh, those do not explicitly indicate the protocol so far and that is part of what led to the, led to the, to the discussion in the meeting on Friday. Now the way it looks like here is like, this might indicate that things completely changed. Um, they, don't, they didn't um, procedurally, but I think on the way we choose to name our things, we've made a bit of progress because we looked into why do we need to indicate something more. And where this comes from is not lacking information in DNS, but it's really lacking information in the, in the literals when we write down an address that doesn't have a name associated with it, but just an IP address. Because we do get the IP address. Uh, we do get the port, but we do not get the information of what is in between, like what kind of port is, the, is this even. So it's like as if we were just past binary data without an indication of, of what to do with it. And with most protocols that works, but with the, as soon as, a pro, as there start being different transports for a protocol that, um, that work, work for either, this, this is becoming ambiguous. So the choice then was to just clarify this in the scheme. But for all the other, um, <clears throat> for the, all the other use cases we've seen so far, um, they are, at least their literal forms, 
they can be unambiguous. So when you, when, for example, when you encode a phone number, there is a way of encoding phone numbers in a way that is compatible with the naming scheme that we have across, uh, that, that we usually use in authorities. Um, this is the DARPA encoding, which kind of might not look, look super nice, but it is practical and it isn't used. Um, for, BLE, uh, for BLE, um, the, the literal, the choice of literal syntax that I was suggesting for coop plus BLE works just as well if there's just coop on the start. And the same goes for uh, slip marks and any possible, say, coop over USB. Um, the, the identifier is in that case locally significant, so it doesn't even need to be fully, uh, fully, fully registered, but it needs to be significant to the local system. If you transport that identifier out of the local system, you get the same um, a weird situation as if you um, send a co-op colon slash slash localhost uh, somewhere around. So taking from, from, from those cases, I think that the criterion where we did need a co-op plus foo is that if the way we encode those, the, the, literal, uh, the literal addresses in a URI um, gives insufficient information to make a decision on the protocol, only then we need this plus. So all the other cases that we've ha we are having um, could easily do without that. Um, so, yeah, that, so this doesn't change transport indication, right? So we can still, the mechanism for indicating that there is another transport available would still be the same. It would still be pointing to some other literal or some other, some, some other name that would then be resolved. Um, but it doesn't need to, the, the recommendation doesn't need to be that we stick with the path that we've had with core plus TCP. Um, yeah, I'm skipping over the aliasing unless someone brings it up. I'm not sure that is is not kind of literals are just part of the part of the story, but those literals are what we get from our resolving system. So um, DNS, as I, as I mentioned before, like DNS is not DNS is not the culprit here. DNS gives us everything we can expect from the um, we, 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 we we do get an address, um, but in the URI the information is missing. If we were to do um, DNS with any other of those later protocols, say someone wanted to use DNS to distribute information about how they find their BLE devices in, say, TIDI, which is also an activity I recommend you can have a look at, um, then those names would just need to be encoded in a form, uh, those literals would just need to be transported in a form that is sufficient. And for BLE, that, that would work given the uh, discovery mechanisms that BLE needs to go through anyway as soon as a connection is established. And when there are other, can, yeah, so this, this works for DNS. Um, this works for, um, for, trend, for uh, discovery mechanisms such as we have in, in resource directory lookup. So if there's a proxy indicated, that proxy, if, if that proxy is indicating a literal address, yep, that uh, either the scheme, uh, either the literal address is sufficient, then it doesn't need to be indicated in the scheme. And if on, on those transports where it is insufficient, um, we do have the schemes um, in there. We could, of course, have done things differently, and I think that the work on um, SVC uh, service ser um, service sorry, I can't expand the acronym right now. S SVCB records um, shows how this would be done, but we do have the schemes for co-op plus TCP, and I think that with any future protocols, we could just avoid the situation altogether. And on those where we cannot. SVCP records will be a good way to transport this information if it is uh, transported uh, through DNS. Yeah, so um, that was way quicker than expected. I hope that there will be questions to make up for it. Um, I think that's a good way forward. I'd like to update um, core interfaces um, to do this and then update core over GAT and then ask Carsten to update uh, Slipmarks. Yeah, um, shall we do that? Oh, I didn't press the thing, sorry. Um, Carsten Bormann, um, yes. And um, I'm not sure we should mention this uh, already, but uh, we had this uh, weird, weird idea of using the IPv future syntax of RC 3986, the URI standard for uh, service binding SVCB 
the truths? Yep. Yep. That so um, if it turns out that any of the future transports that we might do, um, or even the ones that we already have, um, and, and we want to go with SVCP a bit more, um, if, 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 if any transport has SVCP records that can be used here, that's a gap in the, in the things that we can put in a URI. We can, we can put the name in there. We can put the IP address that this eventually resolves down to in, but we can't put the most valuable thing that we get out of that resolution step in SVC. We, we, we can't put that stuff or a subset of that stuff in there, which is telling the transport and telling any, any other deviations. Um, like we can tell the port in a different place, but we can't tell other fields and the other SVCP attributes. But that would be the really more, more practical thing to pass around in a URI instead of an IP address. So that's an option. I don't think it's urgent because we have core plus TCP already for TCP. We don't have any protocols, any transports in the queue that would need this. But as soon as someone starts to do co-op over quick for more than a research paper, um, that's probably the way where it would wind up in DNS. And at latest, then we would need to express that in some less name, more literal form as well. And yep, I think that doing it in an IPv future or some .rpr form in a way that it can be embedded in an um, in the authority component would make a lot of that sense, and I'll just I'll probably ex be explore I'll probably explore a bit of that. Um, there was a comment in the chat from um, Joran uh, .alt um, seems open for anyone to use, and isn't this risk of overlapping? Um, yes, .alt is completely free for all, um, which is why I only suggested this for the um, for the locally significant ones. Because um, like it's a locally significant identifier, the system needs to know what kind of what it can do or cannot do. Um, I don't think that's an option for .ble.arpa or for the for the SMS thing, which already sits on Android.arpa, so it's not thing anywhere. Um, but um, given that a USB or a, um, a serial address must not escape the local system anyway that local system would be responsible for not dealing out identifiers that collide. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm more leaning towards to specifying something under .arpa, which would also queue off any consumers of that URI that this is a locally significant identifier and please treat it as you would treat um, a local host or any IP literal that has its own identifier. Thanks. Um, yeah, some more comments. I think the criterion is very clear uh, on, want, on what to do with that exactly in terms of strictness. I think some slight uh, thought in terms of not recommending why the, the final one, um, I think, was really oriented for forbidding. Um, as, as long as a schema with the plus syntax exists, can it be used if one wants to, even if not necessary? Um. I don't have a clear answer there yet, um, especially because eventually the decision on whether or not, I mean, on the, this is probably about a, a document that defines a new co-op transport will probably be a standards track ITF document. And such a document needs to convince the larger ITF community and um, what the, that it is justified to use a new scheme here. And I think the transport, in, uh, sorry, transport indication, not interfaces. <laughs> uh, transport indication will be at most giving guidance here anyway, uh, and eventually the decision is up to the ITF community. So whether that is guidance to authors or guidance to the ITF community, I can't tell yet. And just to point at this slide six, I believe this is an example of where in this case, you still need the plus syntax. So, yeah, in, in, this. in this case, we need the plus syntax because on, on, co um, on co over TCP, uh, we do have the scheme already introduced. 
And the way to get rid of the plus here would be to say that, hey, with COPE over TCP, we can also use SVCB records and put the literal in there. And then we get, would get rid of it, but that would be a kind of major change in the ecosystem for no benefit other than to fix something that we did back then without, the, without perfect foresight. And I think I have the dates somewhere around here. Um, COPE over TCP was published after the first, very first draft of, of what eventually became SVCB, um, but it was also approved before that. So it's like, yeah, we, we, couldn't, we, we, we couldn't have anticipated that back then, I at least hope. Yes, um, Alexander, very short question. So do you think that, I mean, it looks pretty nice and all that, but if, people, if we go ahead with this, in the future protocols, wouldn't they also need, in addition, like the plus syntax just for legacy stories and, you know, for system? Um, that... What do you mean by new protocols? Do you mean new transports or implement? Yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah. new transports. So the, the new transports would not need um, to have also a plus variation because um, any old client cannot do anything with the um, URI that contains the plus, uh, the, the plus, plus new protocol anyway and can just hand it off in an opaque fashion to proxy that helps it get on. And it can just as well do the same with a co-op URI that has some name that it can't resolve or some IPv future literal it can't resolve. So um, it's the same situation that we don't need to introduce co-op plus um, quick, for example, if we were to do co-op over quick. Uh, okay, so then, the, but the new clients, they need to support the old and the new. Yeah, so um, there is, there is, I don't, pro uh, which is why I don't propose to change um, um, anything for, for COBE, or, COBE over TCP. So for COBE over TCP, we would keep using this because it's already there, it works. We could start sending out SVCP records for, for TCP, but I'm not sure, like, I, I don't see much of the point given that that scheme is already registered. I mean, I really like this, and uh, you know, I, I would really love to not have okay. all these plus Thanks. stuff. But just yeah. the point, the, yeah. I, I, what I wanted to understand is if you know it, it, how the, the 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 evolution will need to the, keep this coexistence working. Yeah, the the but, the, the, the coexistence path that I think is there is for web over TCP, web sockets, TCP, um, uh, TLS, and web sockets with TLS. Do what we've always done, and for everything new, do the other thing. Thank you. Any more comments, questions? No, okay. If you want to, that's time for the last little deck. Yep. So let's go for it. How, we, Off we go. how, how are we on time? Just for, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. okay. Um, so that's a, just a brief update for something that I've presented during interims and that still has the core name in it. Um, because back when I started it, it was unclear whether Lake would, would be recharted. So Lake has been rechartered and can now take extension work on Lake. So, um, yep, but up. Um, basically, um, I think that ad hoc needs a few extensions that just make sure that it will keep working when extensions are present, even though implementations uh, expect that uh, kind of we are built in an ecosystem where they didn't see those in, those extensions ever. Uh, this has worked well for TCP. Uh, sorry, for for TLS. There, this was called Greece, and I've just taken the name, and now we're not putting Greece to TLS, which was the kind of the, the image. Like you have a mechanism, and it rusts shut if you don't if you don't actuate it or at least grease it regularly. Um, so the document, um, focus, please. <laughs> the the thank you. Uh, the document introduces a few ex um, options to ad hoc um, that are actually no op options, but the way they are used. Uh, and the way ad hoc works will ensure that if they are present and the middle box starts, tries to strip them, uh, things will just break apart and then it gets noticed that something is wrong. Um, yeah, a few caveats apply, but I think um, they are best treated in the league working group. So if you're interested in this and want to f uh, follow up um, in the future, um, please look over Lake. Lake is not adopting, kind of has not adopted it yet or started to adoption call, but the rough feedback I got was positive. So. Um, I think this is going there. Thank you. And Christian. 
looks like no comments on this anyway. Uh, so we have still six more minutes, but nothing more to the agenda as far as I understand. Yep. Uh, so we may wrap up the meeting here. Uh, so thank you. Esco has something to say. Yeah, I don't, since we have some time, so there was just one topic that came into mind. So in the Anima working group, we're talking now a lot about discovery. So it could be DNS SD based or co-op uh, link format based or co-op link format plus resource directory based. And there's Grasp as well, another discovery protocol. Um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, a while ago, we had these efforts about also making an sort of update to link format, eh? like encoding it in uh, Cbor. <laughs> I'm just wondering, is, is that on someone's mind still? Uh, I think there are old drafts <laughs> lying around. Uh, yeah, Christian, I'm just, um, that's on my table. Uh, so that so the, uh, so Coral is setting out to be a Cbor based format that will be useful in the situations where you would previously use link format without some of the quirks. Um, the um, ta the the um, the meetings on that topic have, or the, the development of that topic has mainly focused on getting CRIs done first, because um, CRIs like CRIs will be all over the place in this thing, and at the same point, uh, this is also depending a lot on packed Cbor because that would be the the mechanism which keeps it small, even though it's actually lagging around stringish or URI-ish identifiers all over the place. Um, so those are the two things that um, are now converging and will free me up to do um, some more on Coral also when I'm resurfacing from parental leave. Okay, thanks. That clarifies it. So uh, I'll know what to keep in, uh, keep in mind so when <laughs> for that work. Thanks. Thank you. Anything more? <laughs> Okay, then we can really close the meeting and getting four minutes back. Uh, thanks a lot for being here and your time. Thanks to the minute takers. Uh, more in general, thanks a lot for your work and contribution. See you online in the short term, in the mailing list and in three meetings. Thank you all. Hi. Uh, just the technical request that I'll